In this module, we are going to discuss about the various left ventricular outflow tract abnormalities, which will include aortic valve lesions, namely aortic stenosis and regurgitation, aorto left ventricular tunnel, supravalvar lesions, and subvalvar lesions. The conventional way of echocardiographically analyzing the aortic valve and aortic root is by having a look at the short axis and long axis view of the aortic valve and the aortic root. This is an explain imaging of transesophageal echo where we can get a simultaneous short axis view and the long axis view. In the short axis view, we see the three leaflets, namely the right, left and non-coronary leaflets. And in the long axis view, we'll be able to see the iotomitral curtain the aortic annulus, the aortic root, sinotubular junction, and ascending aorta. In two-dimensional echocardiogram, we conceptualize the aortic root as a cylindrical structure with a small bulge at the level of the aortic sinuses. The bulge has got a superior end at sinotubular junction and inferior end, which is the aortoventricular junction. And the bulging portion will be the aortic sinuses of Alcelva. However, when we do a histological section of the left ventricular outflow tract, we recognize that the aortic valve leaflets have got a point of attachment much lower than the anatomic ventricular arterial junction and extending almost into the ventricular myocardium. So the two-dimensional concept of aortic root is not a very sound concept. However, on short axis, what we visualize is the three cusps of the aortic valve, namely the right coronary, left coronary, and non-coronary cusps. The right and the left coronary cusps give off the right and the left coronary arteries. The central fibrous body or the right fibrous trigone corresponds to the region of non-coronary, right coronary commission. This is the location of most of the perimembranous ventricular septal defects. This is the region where the atrioventricular node penetrates and forms the penetrating AV nodal bundle to enter into the ventricle. We notice the aortic annulus is measured in the long axis view, measured from the hinge point to hinge point of the leaflet attachment to the aortic annulus. We also measure the free edges length of the aortic valve. On the long axis, the various measurements that are made are aortic annulus, aortic root, sinotubular junction, ascending aorta, and on short axis, the free edge length, which is taken in systole. Let us see what is the fallacy in this two-dimensional echocardiogram. On a morphological specimen of the aortic root, when we draw a point for measurement of the aortic annulus, which will lie in the blue plane, we notice that we will not be able to get both the hinge points. Even though the blue plane will represent the true aortic annulus, in echocardiogram, what we will be identifying as the annulus will be the two hinge points, or in other words, the red plane. So the true aortic annulus and the echocardiographically derived aortic annulus will never be the same. So this gives importance to the three-dimensional view of the aortic root. If we, if we view the three-dimensional view of the aortic root, it's a crown-shaped structure. It has got a superior end at sinotubular junction a crown-like ring where the valve leaflets are getting attached. There is a ventriculo-arterial anatomic junction where the ventricular muscle joins the aortic tissue. However, the leaflets will be attached both below and above this level of the anatomic ventriculo-arterial junction. We will have a last virtual ring formed by joining the basal attachment of the aortic valve leaflets. In fact, 
the aortic annulus that we measure on two dimensional echocardiogram which combines the hinges of the lowest end of the aortic valve will be passing through this virtual ring. If you lay open a morphological specimen of the aorta, we will be able to appreciate that there is a superior line formed by the sinotubular junction. There will be an anatomic ventricular arterial junction which will course in the middle and there will be a last line which will be a virtual line. The virtual line will be passing through the lowest edges of attachment of the aortic valve leaflets. The aortic valve leaflets will have nadir pines and peaks. The peaks will be going at the level of the commissures. The nadir and the peaks of attachment of the aortic leaflets is better understood in this morphological picture as well as the adjacent cartoon. We will notice that the lowest point of attachment of the leaflets will be at the virtual basal ring and the highest point at the attachment of the commissures will go up to the sinotubular junction. The free edge of the aortic leaflet will have a thickening in the middle which is called as the nodulus of pharyngeus and the nodulus of pharyngeus will extend on both sides as the lunula which is the free edge of the aortic valve cusps. On three dimensional echocardiography we will be able to appreciate this highest points of attachment of the aortic leaflets in the level of commission and the lowest level of point of attachment in the virtual basal ring very clearly. This is a short axis view of three dimensional echocardiogram where we are able to appreciate the three leaflets and three commissures. What we see deep below, my slightly shaded with a light blue color is the aortic annular plane. When we crop off of the aortic root and visualize from one of the side an aortic commissure, we will identify that the basal portions of the aortic valve leaflets are attached at a much lower plane than the aortoventricular junction. However, the commissures are attached at a much higher point at the level of sinotubular junction. The tips of the aortic valve leaflets in diastole should be seen at the level of mid sinuses. With this three dimensional echocardiography, the relation between the aortic and pulmonary valve can be seen even better. This is a cross section taken through the aortic root and pulmonary root. We identify that the pulmonary valve is attached at marginally a higher plane because it is separated out from the heart by a short infundibulum which is named as RBOT. We can identify the right coronary cusp in very close relation to the pulmonary outflow tract. We can notice the right coronary arteries orifice which represents the RCA origin. The cusp that is seen on the other side is the non-coronary cusp. This is the location of subpulmonary ventricular septal defects if it happens in certain individuals. With this background of anatomy of aortic valve, we will go into the different aortic valve lesions. While the normal aortic valve is a trileaflet structure, it can be bicuspid in about 1.3% of the population where the commonest fusion will involve the right coronary cusp. The right cusp may fuse either with the left cusp or with the non-coronary cusp. Very rarely the valve will be unicuspid or quadricuspid. Sometimes even a trileaflet aortic valve can have myxoid dysplasia and result in aortic stenosis. Some of the trileaflet aortic valve can be congenitally be associated with commissural fibrotic fusion and again they may present with aortic stenosis.
Around two-third of congenital aortic stenosis are valvar. This lesion has got a high male preponderance and very often aortic valve lesions may have associations like ventricular septal defect, coarctation and patent ductus arteriosus. Bicuspid aortic valve is a common abnormality seen in clinical practice. A majority of the aortic valves will neither have a substantial degrees of stenosis or regurgitation and are compatible with survival to middle age. This is an example of a short axis view taken from parasternal short axis which shows the fusion of right coronary cusp and non coronary cusp. We can see that it forms a raphe. When bicuspid aortic valve goes on to middle age group, the aortic root and the ascending aorta starts to dilate significantly and they may be associated with anilo aortic ectasia. This is an example of a bicuspid aortic valve which has survived to 50s and are associated with marked annular dilatation and anilo aortic ectasia. We can compare the size of the adjacent pulmonary annulus along with this dilated aortic root and aortic annulus. Unicuspid aortic valves will have an appearance like a teardrop in the aortic root. This is an example of a neonatal critical aortic stenosis. On short axis we identify that the leaflets are seen as a small teardrop in the posterior portion of the aortic annulus. In the example shown with unicuspid aortic valve and critical aortic stenosis, we can notice that the color Doppler interrogation of the aortic arch is showing a complete flow reversal in the arch of aorta, which indicates that the circulation in this patient is entirely duct dependent. When there is a duct dependency of systemic circulation, the main pulmonary artery feeds the descending thoracic aorta through the ductus arteriosus and the flow reverses back into the aortic arch to supply the carotid and cerebral circulation and the coronary circulation by flow reversal. This will be represented by a red color of blood flow in the aortic arch. Yet another benign abnormality of the aortic valve will be a quadricuspid aortic valve where there are four cusps. Sometimes all the four cusps may be very symmetrical as in this patient, but in some of the patients one of the cusps may be very rudimentary. Let us start analyzing bicuspid aortic valves which are presenting in childhood age with stenosis. This is a short axis of the aortic valve with asymmetric cusps. The left coronary cusp is smaller. The fused right and the non coronary cusp is looking very large and there is a clear doming of the aortic valve. When we magnify that short axis, we are able to appreciate that there is a substantial thickening of the free edges, nodularity of the posterior commissural area which are all characteristic features of bicuspid aortic valves. On the long axis, we will notice the thick dysplastic aortic valve with significant aortic stenosis. This will be the location where we measure the aortic annulus. On two-dimensional echocardiography, the aortic annulus is measured from the hinge points seen on the anterior and posterior plane. On color Doppler interrogation, we appreciate a very eccentric posteriorly directed jet caused by severe aortic stenosis. There is no aortic regurgitation. High velocity gradients of aortic stenosis can only be measured 
by utilizing the continuous wave Doppler, we can notice that there is a mean gradient of 92 millimeters of mercury and peak gradient of 140 millimeters of mercury in this example. Concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, which is a usual feature seen in most of the patients with bicuspid aortic valve associated with aortic stenosis, is one of the predisposing factors for late onset arrhythmias in adulthood. In the previous example, we found an asymmetric cusps of bicuspid aortic valve. In some patients, the cusps will be very symmetric. This is an example of a patient with truly bicuspid aortic valve where there is no raffle formation and we identify two cusps and both are more or less symmetric. On a frozen systolic frame, we can identify that there are no raffle tissues there are two commissures on either side of the aortic valve and the cusps are more or less symmetric and equal. On a long axis view of this aortic valve, we can notice a substantial doming. Both the leaflets dome in systole and the aortic annulus can be measured at the anterior and posterior hinge points in this view. The two mechanisms of aortic stenosis in a bicuspid aortic valve are one, commissural fusion, two, reduced length of the free edge. When the free edge length is reduced, the free edge remains very taut and does not expand very well during systole. The decision about aortic valvotomy will be taken only if there is a commissural fusion as the etiology for aortic stenosis. In this short axis view, we can identify an anterior and a posterior commission. On the anterior commission that is seen away from the probe, we can identify that there is some commissural fusion. So this is a valve that may be amenable for aortic valvotomy. On an explain imaging, we can identify the, both the short axis and the long axis at the same time. On the short axis view, we can identify the anterior commissure which is fused and the free edges are very thick. When the free edges are very thick, they usually don't get torn during valvotomy. We also need to exclude a significant aortic regurgitation before resorting to aortic valvotomy. We can see the fused commissures the raffe on a three-dimensional echocardiogram where the aortic view of the valve is shown on FAS. The thickened free edges, the commissural fusion are all seen far better on the 3D surgeon's view from the ascending aorta. The aortic valve area can be planimetered on three-dimensional echocardiogram, we cannot trace the free edges of the aortic valve orifice. Instead, we need to use an image grid. Each of the image grids are two meter, millimeters apart. And so this will give a valve area in this particular example of close to two and a half squares, which will be an equivalent of 0.5 square centimeter. In the same example, post aortic valvotomy, we can notice a good split of the commissure resulting in a much wider valve area. On long axis, with color flow Doppler, we can notice a mild aortic regurgitation as a result of the procedure, but a good valve opening. On three dimensional echocardiography, we can identify the commissural split that has been achieved by the balloon aortic valvotomy. When a neonate presents with severe valvar aortic stenosis, there is an associated left ventricular endocardial fibroelastosis, which will be seen as marked echogenicity of the left ventricular endocardium or sometimes only confined to the papillary muscles. 
In this example, we can see a dense papillary muscle fibrosis and scarring. This is due to severe subendocardial ischemia caused by high left ventricular end diastolic pressures. The left ventricular function is often impaired in all these patients who manifest left ventricular endocardial fibroelastosis and we can notice that there is no aortic regurgitation. On a short axis view, we can appreciate a bicuspid aortic valve with an anterior commissural fusion. In spite of the severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction, there is a peak gradient of 71 millimeters of mercury and mean gradient of 37 millimeters of mercury. Every gradient that we obtain by continuous wave Doppler across a stenotic aortic valve has to be correlated along with the left ventricular function. In the presence of severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction, a gradients of 70 and 37 will account to very severe aortic stenosis. On short axis view, we can notice the poor left ventricular contractility. We can also notice the marginal echogenicity of the left ventricular endocardium, which is an indicator of early endocardial fibroelastosis. Immediately after a balloon aortic valvotomy, there is a good recovery of left ventricular systolic function. We can notice that the left ventricular contractility is far better in this view with a trickle of aortic regurgitation as a result of the procedure. After aortic valvotomy, the gradients have reduced to peak gradients of 40 and mean gradients of 28. We need to understand that the pre-procedural gradient of 70 over 37 was obtained in the face of very severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction. However, the post balloon aortic valvotomy gradients of 40 over 28 are obtained with a good left ventricular systolic function. When the left ventricular systolic contractility is very good, the gradients will be higher. Some of the patients with critical aortic stenosis with left ventricular systolic dysfunction and endocardial fibroelastosis may have associated mitral regurgitations. In this example of patient who had a severe fibroelastosis involving the papillary muscles and scarred papillary muscles, there is a severe mitral regurgitation. On a long axis view, we can identify the narrow jet of aortic stenosis and severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Short axis view, there is a partial fusion of the right coronary and non-coronary cusps to form a raphe. Most of the fusions will involve the right coronary cusps. Low gradient aortic stenosis is a very peculiar entity. This is a severe aortic stenosis causing very low gradients due to left ventricular systolic dysfunction. In this parasternal long axis view, we can identify very severe LV systolic dysfunction in a patient who has aortic stenosis and also a mild aortic regurgitation and mild mitral regurgitation. When we look at the short axis of this aortic valve, this is a bicuspid aortic valve with a complete fusion of the right and non-coronary cusps to form a thick calcific raphe. There is an anterior commissural fusion resulting in a small posterior orifice. So by valve area planimetry, we will find that there is a very severe aortic stenosis compared to the entire aortic root area. However, when we check the left ventricular outflow track gradients with continuous wave Doppler, we find a peak gradient of 34 millimeters of mercury and mean gradient of only 18 millimeters of mercury. Also notice that there is a pulses alternance. That means every alternative systole is resulting in slightly higher gradient and the other beats have a lower gradient. This is a feature of severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction.
we look at the left ventricular outflow tract velocities, the LVOT VTI is around 20.3 centimeters and this gives a calculated aortic valve area according to continuity equation of around 1.5 square centimeters. This might give an impression as if the aortic valve area is quite big and the aortic stenosis is not very severe. On a short axis of the left ventricle, we can identify that there is a very severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction. The MO tracing of the left ventricle shows a left ventricular internal dimension of 71 millimeters in diastole and 64 millimeters in systole giving a fractional shortening of less than 10 percent. So the question is are we dealing with an aortic stenosis which is very mild but there is an coexisting cardiomyopathy causing a left ventricular systolic dysfunction or is the aortic stenosis very severe and that is resulting in an afterload mismatch and causing a severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction. This is answered when we do a three dimensional echocardiography and see the aortic valve opening. We appreciate that the entire aortic valve opening is less than 0.5 square centimeter by planimetry and so this will amount to a very critical aortic stenosis. Compared to the wide aortic root, we can notice that the aortic valve area is very very small. We can notice that there is a right coronary non-coronary cusp fusion along with calcification of the raphe and a substantial reduction in the effective valve orifice area. So these are clear examples where a three-dimensional echocardiogram will give substantially more information than a 2D echo evaluation. Whenever there is an extremely low gradient aortic stenosis, the values of aortic valve area that we obtain by continuous continuity equation may be very fallacious. Bicuspid aortic valves can be associated with combinations of aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. We can appreciate the combination of stenotic and regurgitant jets by using continu continuous wave Doppler across the left ventricular outflow tract. This is a parasternal long axis view showing thin leaflets which are doming indicative of aortic stenosis and there is a mild concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. On a color flow imaging from the apical view, we can notice that there is a combination of aortic stenosis and regurgitation. It is not uncommon to see this combination of aortic stenosis and regurgitation in patients with bicuspid aortic valve. On a short axis view, we appreciate that the primary location of regurgitation is along the posterior commissure. Bicuspid aortic valves which are functioning too well in early childhood will start to deteriorate as the person passes on to adolescence and adulthood. This is due to progressive calcification of certain regions of the aortic valves. The commonest area to get calcified will be the raffle tissue which is formed by the fusion of the commissures and the free edges and the commissures may also get calcified. As the calcification progresses, the aortic stenosis becomes more and more significant. If there is no calcification and if the length of the free edge is quite relaxed, then there will not be any aortic stenosis at all in the patients with bicuspid aortic valve. In this example shown, there is no calcification of the leaflets and there is a sufficiently long free edge of both the leaflets and the valve functions very effectively. If the free edge of 
leaflets in bicuspid aortic valve is very short. This produces a bowstring effort effect and results in aortic stenosis. Whereas, if the free edge length of the leaflets is sufficiently long, the valve opens very well and there is no aortic stenosis. On three-dimensional echocardiography in certain systolic phases, we can appreciate the redundant long free edge of both the leaflets in this bicuspid aortic valve. Another common pediatric problem that we see with aortic valve is the leaflet prolapse in association with ventricular septal defects. Aortic valve prolapse may be seen in two different types of ventricular septal defects. In perimembranous ventricular septal defect, the defects are located immediately below the commissure which is present between the non-coronary cusp and right coronary cusp. So, either of these cusps may prolapse through the perimembranous ventricular septal defect. When the left ventricle pumps in systole, there is a high left ventricular systolic pressure and a low right ventricular systolic pressure resulting in a high pressure jet from the LV into the RV. This results in a venturi effect and causes the leaflet to be sucked in into the low pressure area. In patients with perimembranous ventricular septal defect, the aortoventricular junction is very well formed. The leaflet progressively gets elongated and prolapses. However, in subpulmonary VSD, the VSDs are located below the right coronary cusp and so only the right coronary cusp prolapses. The reason for the prolapse of right coronary cusp in a subpulmonary VSD is due to lack of support of the leaflet tissue caused by a defective aortoventricular junction. On this short axis transesophageal view, we can appreciate a large perimembranous ventricular septal defect in 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock position of the aortic root. We can notice both the non-coronary cusp and the right coronary cusp bulging through the ventricular septal defect and partially closing it off. On a long axis view, we can notice that the posterior non-coronary cusp is substantially protruding through the perimembranous ventricular septal defect. We can appreciate on the color flow images the color flow from the left ventricle to the right ventricle and a trickle of jet of aortic regurgitation caused by this non-coronary cusp prolapse. On the long axis imaging, we can notice that not only there is a prolapse of the non-coronary cusp, there is also a buckling of the right coronary cusp. Very commonly in perimembranous ventricular septal defects, both these leaflets prolapse. In subpulmonary ventricular septal defects, it is the right coronary cusp which alone prolapses. The problem is caused by a defective aortoventricular junction resulting in sagging of the right coronary cusp. We can notice on the other side of the left ventricular outflow tract the pulmonary valve leaflets. We can appreciate that the right coronary cusp prolapses immediately below the pulmonary valve leaflets. Sometimes an extensive right coronary cusp prolapse can cause a right ventricular outflow tract obstruction because of this protruding leaflet tissue into the right ventricular outflow tract. Whenever there is an anterior right coronary cusp prolapse, the aortic regurgitation will be posteriorly be directed towards the anterior mitral leaflet and it will be very eccentric. On a parasternal long axis view, we can appreciate the marked prolapse of the right coronary cusp through a large subpulmonary VSD, effectively reducing the size of the ventricular septal defect. The prolapsing right coronary cusp can form a sinus of Valsalva aneurysm and in some of the adolescent and adults, it may rupture into the right ventricular outflow tract, thereby increasing the quantum of aortic regurgitation and left right shunt. The aortic regurgitation caused by right coronary cusp prolapse in a subpulmonary VSD will be posteriorly be directed towards the anterior mitral leaflet 
and will be very eccentric. These eccentric jets of aortic regurgitation may appear to be mild to moderate. However, if we interrogate the flows in the thoracic and abdominal aorta, there will be marked flow reversal indicating that the aortic regurgitation is very substantial and severe. We need to consider the eccentricity of the aortic regurgitation color Doppler jet before deciding on the severity of aortic regurgitation. After a detailed discussion on the aortic valve, now let us move on to supravalvar narrowing. The supravalvar narrowing is commonly in the form of a hourglass narrowing. However, very rarely we may see a supravalvar membrane. This parasternal long axis view shows a typical hourglass narrowing seen in the sinotubular junction and in the proximal ascending iota. We can notice that the ascending iota is substantially thick. In fact, during surgery, the surgeons have identified that this portion of the iota is extremely thick and sometimes even cartilaginous. Some of these patients with supravalvar aortic narrowing may be associated with Williams syndrome. However, it can be non-syndromic also. While the commonest form of supravalvar narrowing is a hourglass type of obstruction caused by a diffuse thickening of the iota in the region of sinotubular junction and proximal ascending iota, very rarely the supravalvar aortic narrowing can be caused by a membranous obstruction. In this parasternal long axis view, the arrow points to a membrane that is seen from the region of sinotubular junction. On a color flow imaging, we can appreciate that the gradient is starting from the level of the membrane and it is much higher than the level of the valve. We can see a trickle of aortic regurgitation from the valvar level. There is a significant gap between the valve and the membrane. In this parasternal long axis view, we can appreciate the supravalvar membrane very clearly and a good gap between the aortic valve leaflets and the supravalvar membrane. Left ventricular outflow tract obstruction can occur at subvalvar level due to subaortic membrane or accessory AV valve tissue. It sometimes can be dynamic as in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. This is an epical long axis view that shows a discrete subaortic membrane located immediately below the right coronary cusp. We can notice that there is a substantial aortic stenosis caused by this discrete subaortic membrane. Most of the subaortic membranes are very close to the right coronary cusp and they impair the mobility of the right coronary cusp and cause fibrosis of the right coronary cusp. This results in milder degrees of aortic regurgitation in almost all patients with subaortic membrane. We can notice that in this clinical example, the aortic stenosis gradient has has a peak gradient of 120 millimeters of mercury and mean gradient of 70 millimeters of mercury and there is a yeah, mild aortic regurgitation. From a parasternal long axis view, we can notice a discrete subaortic membrane protruding from the anterior wall of the left ventricular outflow tract immediately below the right coronary cusp. We can also notice that the right coronary cusp is more thicker and has got restricted mobility. On a transesophageal long axis view of the left ventricular outflow tract, again we can notice the thick subaortic membrane immediately beneath the right coronary cusp. We can also notice a subtle tinting of the anterior mitral leaflet. Most of the subaortic membrane will be circumferential and will have an attachment posteriorly towards the iotomitral curtain as well. Since there is a sclerosis and rigidity of the right coronary cusp due to the jet effect of the subaortic membrane, 
the closure of the aortic valve is often defective and this will result in mild to moderate degrees of aortic regurgitation in most of the patients. This is a point of differentiation between the dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction caused by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In dynamic obstruction caused in HOCM, the aortic valve functioning will be intact. Whereas in subaortic membrane, due to sclerosis and fibrosis of the right coronary cusp, there will be aortic regurgitation. On three-dimensional echocardiogram, when we visualize the aortic valve and the left ventricular outflow from above through the aorta, we can see the three leaflets of the aortic valve. The free edge of the right coronary cusp is thicker and beneath the aortic leaflets, a circumferential membrane with a circular orifice. The orifice refers to the lumen of the subaortic membrane. The frozen frames from aorta, both in diastole and systole. In diastole, we can notice the three leaflets in a closed position and we can identify that the free edge of the right coronary cusp is far more thicker than the other two leaflets. However, when the leaflets open out in systole, we can see the subaortic membrane underneath and the orifice through which the left ventricle ejects into the aortic valve through the subaortic membrane is seen very well. On a long axis view on 3D, we can appreciate the discrete subaortic membrane located immediately beneath the right coronary cusp. Whenever the distance between the subaortic membrane and the aortic leaflets is very short, there is more aortic regurgitation. While in majority of cases, a subaortic membrane will be a discrete, thick membrane, in some patients, it will be a thick fibromuscular ridge of tissue. This is an example of a patient with subaortic stenosis where there is a thick fibromuscular ridge. The third morphology of severe subaortic stenosis is a diffuse fibromuscular tunnel. This is an example of a diffuse thick fibromuscular tunnel. There is no discrete membrane that is protruding in the subvalvar LVOT. However, we can notice that the left ventricular outflow tract is very narrow. We can also notice the sclerosis and immobility of the right coronary cusp. Color flow imaging shows a severe aortic stenosis associated with moderate aortic regurgitation caused by the sclerosis and rigidity of the right coronary cusp. In these patients with subaortic stenosis, there can be severe degrees of left ventricular hypertrophy. We can notice in this example that the left ventricular free wall is almost as thick as 2 centimeters. Sometimes LVOT obstruction can be caused by accessory AV valve tissues from the mitral valve. In this example, there is a cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet with the caudal tissue from the cleft attaching towards the left ventricular outflow tract resulting in subvalvar aortic stenosis. On color flow imaging, we can notice that there is a severe left ventricular outflow tract narrowing in the subvalvar LVOT caused by this cleft anterior mitral leaflets abnormal attachment towards the interventricular septum. On a subsified short axis view, we can notice the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet, the caudal attachment from the mitral leaflet towards the thickened interventricular septum. The left ventricular outflow tract obstruction in these patients are caused by the short cordae that are present between the anterior mitral leaflet and the interventricular septum, which narrows the left ventricular outflow tract. Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is a reason for dynamic LVOT obstruction. Here, the LVOT obstruction is caused by systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet 
caused by hypercontractile left ventricle. When we see the left ventricular septum and free wall on echocardiography, we can identify the myocardial fiber disarray, the altered echogenicity of the myocardium. There is a marked systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet narrowing the left ventricular outflow tract in systole. On a color Doppler interrogation, we can appreciate a severe left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and a moderate mitral regurgitation caused by the systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet. By continuous wave Doppler through the left ventricular outflow tract, we can appreciate the LVOT gradients of more than 100 millimeters of mercury. See the dagger-like signal which is characteristic of a dynamic LVOT obstruction. Also notice that there will be a beat-to-beat -beat variation of the left ventricular outflow tract depending on various factors that include left ventricular preload, systemic vascular resistance. One of the modalities of treatment of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy in the interventional cath lab will be to inject alcohol in the first septal artery to cause a necrosis and infarction of the basal portions of the intraventricular septum which overlies the region of systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet. In this example, a parasternal long axis view of the left ventricular outflow tract done on a patient who had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and had an alcohol septal ablation about three months earlier demonstrates a substantial reduction in the LV mass in the basal portions of the interventricular septum. When we do a color flow interrogation, we can appreciate that there is no left ventricular outflow tract obstruction now and the mitral regurgitation has also come down substantially. Post septal ablation, the LVOT gradient has reduced to less than 2 meter per second. One of the rare abnormalities seen in the left ventricular outflow tract is aorticolift left ventricular tunnel. This refers to a tunnel like communication from the aortic root into the left ventricular outflow tract on one of the sides of the aortic valve leaflets. It's very commonly seen in the region above the left right commissure and it burrows through the interventricular septum and enters the left ventricular outflow tract from its anterior wall. This results in a paravalvar aortic regurgitation. On this parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate the three leaflets of the aortic valve which are very well formed. There is a large tunnel that is seen on the outer surface of the commissure between the right coronary cusp and left coronary cusp. This tunnel starts from the sinotubular junction, burrows through the interventricular septum and causes a large paravalvar aortic regurgitation. On a transesophageal echocardiogram in the long axis view, we can appreciate the broad tunnel which causes a severe aortic regurgitation. By using an explain imaging where we can get a simultaneous long axial and short axial cut of the left ventricular outflow tract, we can appreciate that the paravalvar left ventricular outflow tunnel is located in the region of right coronary and left coronary cusps. The free aortic regurgitation caused through this aorto left ventricular tunnel is seen on this transesophageal long axial view. Aortic root diseases are another abnormalities that will result in progressive aortic regurgitation. In this long axial view from transesophageal echocardiogram, we can appreciate that there is a substantial dilatation of the aortic root. However, the leaflet co is normal and there is no aortic regurgitation.
This is seen in patients with aortic root dilatation as in bicuspid aortic valve, Marfan syndrome and other reasons of anloyartic ectasia. In the early phases of aortic root dilatation, the aortic valve leaflets will coopt very well and there will not be any aortic regurgitation. We can appreciate that the aortic root is dilated to close to 48 millimeters and the annulus is dilated to close to 24 millimeters. On a short axis view, we can appreciate the three leaflets with a normal closure without any regurgitant orifice in the center. As the aortic root dilatation progresses more and more, there will be effacement of these leaflets resulting in aortic regurgitation. On a three-dimensional echocardiogram from the ascending aortic view or otherwise the surgeon's view, we can appreciate the thinned out leaflets and a small regurgitant orifice in this example and this will result in mild aortic regurgitation. As the anuloaortic ectasia worsens, there will be effacement of the leaflets resulting in lack of cooptation of the leaflets. As the anuloaortic ectasia dilates further and further, there will be splaying of the commissures. We can appreciate the splaying of the commissure in this example between the left coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp on short axis of the transesophageal echocardiogram. This playing of the commissures and effacement of the leaflets will result in progressively more aortic regurgitation. We should try to understand the aortic valve in a three-dimensional perspective as a crown-shaped structure. Pathology may exist in the aortic valve leaflets, aortic root, ascending aorta or in the subvalvar left ventricular outflow tract.